and sit on my little, there's all the details, website, Twitter handle. Um, if you want to follow along with the lots of tricky code that I'm going to show you and Nginx configurations and things, this link at the bottom here is edward.tl slash Nginx talk will take you to um, a list of links, basically. Um, and you can look at the individual files I'm talking about. But I'll just give you a, a brief overview of um, what it is I'm going to cover. Um, one of my clients has a really, really busy site. Um, it's a site that um, is a live event. Uh, it's, it's called I'm a Scientist, Get Me Out of Here. Some of you have heard, will have heard me talk about it in the past. Um, but the essence of the site is that um, for a couple of weeks, two or three times a year, um, schools come onto this site, they get the, um, the kids in science lessons to sign up, um, they get to ask questions of scientists who also sign up and put profiles on there, uh, and they get to do real-time chats, and then um, it's, it's really, really good, it's part of the national curriculum, science in the real world. Um, after one week of doing this, they then start voting the scientists off, and at the end of the event, uh, one scientist wins £500 to spend on, on, promote, uh, on promoting their science. Absolutely brilliant ev uh, event. Um, the big one that we do is in June, um, and we have uh, we use WordPress multi-site, and we have uh, zones. So each zone might have five or six scientists on it, between 20 and 40 schools on it. So that's 20 and 40 classes with 20 to 40 kids in each one. Um, mm -hmm. And we very quickly discovered as we ramped up to this 20 zone event. Uh, that running real-time chats through WordPress is an utterly stupid thing to do. <laughs> um, but not only that, um, even just running, I think we maxed out at seven simultaneous real-time chats in WordPress. Um, we managed to bring a 16 processor, 63 gigabyte server to its knees, which is quite a feat. Um, and so we looked at how on earth we could do this. We'd moved from a previously from a uh, from an eight processor box because the, it wasn't coping. So we thought 16 uh, pro 16 processors is going to be fine. 63 gig of RAM. What could go wrong? And we still managed to bring it to his knees. Um, we were running standard LAMP stack, although the PHP was already separate, so it wasn't mod PHP, which means it's combined as part of. Uh, Apache, which is, can also slow your system down, um, and we realised that it wasn't right. So I decided that we needed to look at Nginx, um, and I started investigating Nginx. You can find loads of useful information on how to run WordPress under Nginx on the web, and you can follow some step-by-step -step instructions. There's stuff on the WordPress codex, um, and it's great as long as you're only running one site on that server. They all assume you're running one site. They assume if you need to go to Nginx, you're probably already on a VPS or a dedicated server, and you're only going to be running one site. Um, and what I realized was that the way that they tell you to set it up, effectively all websites, you can put multiple sites on there, but they all run the same PHP user and the same PHP processors, which is instantly insecure. So. Um, it's, it's something that uh, even under Apache can get wrong. Um, if, again, if you're running mod PHP and you don't set up um, Apache correctly, you can end up that all sites are running their PHP code under the same user, which means that for something like WordPress, where it needs to write to the filing system, in theory, your PHP could write to somebody else's filing system, to some other, somebody else's home directory on a shared server, unless it's set up right. But they know that, and they've figured out did I want to do that? Probably not, was it? No. Edge your own. It wasn't on edge your own. That's okay. Um, and they figured out um, on the Apache stack how to do that properly. But I couldn't find anything on Nginx on how to do that. Um, so I ended up having to figure it out for myself. Uh, so I'm going to take you through some basic things. That was my one slide. I've got one that says questions at the end, but that's basically my one slide. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is start taking you through. Um, no, I do need to connect to the network. Let me just. Reconnect. Um, City guest, was it? Yes. Okay. Um, and if this is too small, I'm going to up the size of it because it probably is. Uh, is that is that legible or does it need to be bigger? Oh, it's 
Was it bigger then? It's okay. Oh, it's okay. Oh, good. At the back, it's okay. That's great. You're better eyes than me. Um, so, if this thing will actually reconnect. Oh, dear. Why are you not connecting? No, that just gave up. Oh, no, there we go. Um, and for those of you who use SSH, anybody use SSH regularly? Like, all the time? Isn't it a pain when you walk away from your terminal and they come back and it's disconnected you? Or you're on the train and it doesn't work and you use? This thing that I'm using is called MOSH, M-O-S-H. You install it on the server, you install it, install it locally, and it keeps the connection alive. Look, it's just reconnected for me. That's been going since this morning, and I was using it on the train. Dead good, MOSH. Um, so, what I'm going to do is um, actually talk you through the way I have my server set up. So the first thing that I use is, oh, it's losing it again. This is not happy network. Um, we'll see how we get, how we get on. Uh, so the first thing that I use is a system called Virtual Min. I'll show you my main server, I might as well. Um, but if we keep losing the net, I'm going to struggle. Come on. Um, while I'm waiting for that to come up, the reason I use Virtual Min, it's a GPL control panel. So those of you who hate cPanel and Plesk and all of them actually, I've never found a decent control panel. Um, this one, Webmin, it's based on Webmin, which has been around for a long time, is less painful than a lot of the others. Uh, but Virtual Min is another system that runs around it, so it uses Webmin for a lot of its work, but it also does manages virtual hosts for you. Um, and this network is not being... Does anybody else have any network problems? Should I go and get my own? I have my own if I need to. Oh, that's all right. I've got one. I've got a 4G box. Yeah, yeah. Always prepared. I have my own internet box. <laughs> Um, I'll just keep, keep talking. So um, I use Virtual Min because it does a lot of stuff for me. I actually keep turning things off because I, I no longer host e email for people because <sighs> it just hurts. It's painful hosting email. Um, so I turn lots of things off and I don't do DNS. I actually have my DNS external as well. Um, but what this does is it does things like set up new users for me. I want to put a new site on my, on my uh, server. Virtual Min will uh, set up the new, new uh, site for me. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Are we there? Uh, oh, come on now. Do it again. Oh, well, it's got signal. Oh, there we go. There I am. Hey, we're in. Uh, there we go. So, um, this is the interface you get with Virtual Min. Um, it's got some summary information, real memory, virtual memory, this, that, and the other. Um, but it has really nice, simple, create virtual server. You give it a, host, uh, a domain name, and it give it a new user, and it'll create a new user for you. It will set up, I've got it set up to, to use Nginx. Again, it uses Apache by default and PHP on um, mod, uh, FCGI. Um, but I've got Nginx installed on there, so now I can basically say I want an Nginx website, I want a de uh, MySQL database, and it will set those things up for me. But the way it sets Nginx up does not work for WordPress. It will work for a standard PHP file, but it doesn't work for WordPress. So that's where it gets tricky. Um, but I like the fact that it sets the user up pro properly. It sets up a new PHP process for each user. So they get their own independent PHP <coughs> processes. So that handles the security thing. Of course, it sets up the, the file permissions and everything on the directory. Um, but um, the, the way it sets up PHP is not quite right. Sorry, Nginx is not quite right. So um, just to that link I gave you before, uh, takes you to this 
which has got all the links and all the tools that I'm going to talk about along the way as well. Um, but I'm just going to address each one, and again, we'll make this bigger if we need to. So, um, let me grab... Uh, yes, Mike, could you make it bigger? I can't read it. I'm yeah, I will. But as soon as I drill into a file, uh, which is the best one to start with. Uh, <coughs> oh, there we go. As an example, uh, let's whack that up a bit. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, from the standard Nginx configuration, so when Nginx gets installed, it just works. It, I'm, I happen to use Ubuntu because I'm most familiar with that. I've been using it for uh, a decade probably, nearly a decade. Uh, oh, it is, yeah, it's 11 years now. Um, <coughs> and um, it does the similar thing to Apache in that it puts all the virtual hosts in a subdirectory called Sites Available, and then when a site is enabled, it creates a symbolic link um, in the Sites Enabled uh, directory. And a basic server that it sets up looks like this top bit. So it sets up the server name, in my case wpexamples.com, the IP address that it's going to listen on, um, root directory where all the files are, it sets up what your index files are, access log, error log and so on. Nicely sets up the fact that you have separate access and error logs for each individual site, so that's useful if you're uh, parsing those and looking for things in particular, you don't get everything from every site in the same one. It sets up a whole bunch of fast CGI param malarkey, just does it, it just works. Um, and then it normally sets up um, this last bit, this location here, which basically says, got all the PHP files, um, try to find a file that exists. If it doesn't do a 404, and that's a big security issue, that needs to say that, because apparently you used to be able to fool Nginx to execute <coughs> things that weren't really PHP, uh, and vice versa, get it, get it to execute image files and things like that. So that URI equals 404 sorts that out. Um, um, and this next line, fast CGI pass, just basically tells Nginx, if it's a PHP file, pass it to this socket. So this is the thing that's been set up uniquely for this particular site, to wpexamples.com, um, in my example. So a whole bunch of other stuff on there that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, but that's key. I wish this was more predictable, but it genuinely creates a random number. Um, and just to show you what... Um, that looks like, uh, the PHP script that does that for you, let me go and find, uh, there we go, um, and this is just done automatically, I never have to touch this because, uh, um, this is just done for me by virtual main, and basically what it's doing is it's switching user to the particular user who owns this site, this is how you get unique users for each, and then it's running a bunch of PHP stuff, in this case I've only got two threads running, uh, there's a build thing that spawns new threads and it's got this unique ID that's unique to this user running this instance of PHP. I can tweak those numbers through the virtual min interface. If I need loads more threads, it's a really busy site. I can further with those numbers. Um, but, yeah, it just does a thing and, it, and it's great and it's sorted it out for me. Um, and that number there ended in 5768 as it happens, matches the one in here that's telling it what to talk to. So that transfers control of anything for PHP over to the PHP, so that's where your WordPress stuff uh, starts to run. Um, there are a couple of extra things that you can do as well. So here we've got a specific rule for WP login, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Another one for XML RPC. Some of you might guess what they are. Well, then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's common to all WordPress sites, and this is the bit that's modified from what you can find on the web on how to run it for one. Um, so I've got some WordPress common configuration that I'll pull in. I've got WordPress Supercache. I use Supercache on all my sites. Um, other caching plugins are available. Um, and they need different sets of rules as well. So I'll show you some resources where I've got my, uh, my start point for all this. And then, as it happens, um, Yoast's SEO uh, sitemap, if you view the sitemap in a, um, in a browser, it tries to pull in a, um, a CSS file to make it look pretty for humans, even though it's meant to be human readable. Um, and it actually requires a specific rule um, within um, Nginx to make that work. Thankfully, they do tell you, if you run it, if you run a Yoast SEO under Nginx, it pops up on the XML sitemaps page and tells you, you need to add these bits to your Nginx. Unfortunately, there's two lines and not three. 
Um, I figured out the third one, so I'll share that with you as well. And then this last bit, this is interesting because in all the examples that I've ever found of uh, Nginx, WordPress Nginx on the web, that bit is in the common files. And this is the, the, the super cache thing. It's, again, it's making the assumption that you're only actually running one site. So, um, again, doesn't, doesn't quite work. Um, so I have it unique here. So I'll show you what's in some of these common things. Um, so uh, let's go back to here. So we've got WordPress common, uh, com file. Um, <coughs> just some standard stuff. And if you've ever fiddled with or tweaked uh, .ht access file, especially if you start looking at security and things like that, or looking at caching <coughs> and cache timeouts of uh, standard stuff, you'll, you'll recognize some of these are just the Nginx equivalent. <coughs> so here, um, this was from an old bug in a Kismet where um, a Kismet would talk to itself, um, but there was something wrong where people were trying to access it. I think it was probably possibly a, uh, an XSS bug or something like that, but at some point we, I needed to put this in. I think the bug's probably been fixed and I can remove that there uh, now. Um, uh, here's a rewrite one, just um, something that Apache does for you automatically. Uh, if you access uh, slash WP admin without a slash on the end, uh, Apache will redirect you to the one with the slash on the end because that just works. But it's actually one more request, one more back and forth between the browser and um, your server just because you've got links without a slash on the end or they didn't type the slash on the end. Um, Nginx won't do that for you automatically, so there's a rule that does that. Um, this is uh, an interesting one, and again, there's an equivalent in, in Apache, if you've ever fiddled with this stuff, but basically all the stuff that's non-dynamic, uh, image files, zip files, exe files, exe files, I hope I'm not serving exe files, <laughs> docs, XLS, anything uh, that's not dynamic, uh, set a 24-hour cache expiry on it, um, and also don't log it in the, in the log files as well, because I'm not that concerned about tracking how many how many time the images have downloaded. I'm just concerned about my pages, my WordPress pages. Um, um, and it even doesn't log the 404s, which sometimes when you're developing a site you'll want on, but once you're there, it's just more logging that you don't care about. Um, similarly, CSS and JavaScript. Um, I've got this separate uh, because I was fiddling with, the, with those numbers for a while, um, but also because I wanted to be able to log them and see what was going on. In fact, I'm still experimenting on this and concatenating CSS files and so on. Um, so I've got a separate rule that's effectively doing the same stuff as this for a couple of different extensions. Um, and this is where, um, again, this is common stuff that you see um, covering all your sites, but um, in fact, it's just this one line that's commented out that stops it being common for everyone, is that that bit, that rule is in each individual site's file. Um, and then just a couple of other ones, uh, again adding, uh, what's this one doing? Um, oh, that's interesting. Oh, if it doesn't exist, uh, rewrite admin, oh okay, yeah, so it's, so it's, just, it's just trying to rewrite things, beginning with WP uh, to the right place. Um, and uh, stuffing the WP admin folder <coughs> and redirecting them uh, directly to the WP admin. Um, and then another one, of course, every single browser and every single um, bot asks for robots.txt, whether it exists or not. Um, if you're running WordPress, you don't have to have one. WordPress will handle it dynamically, which means you have to tell Nginx to pass it on to WordPress. So if it doesn't exist, pass it on to WordPress. Um, and then also, I just don't want to log the fact that every single hit get hits uh, robots.txt. Um, I should probably do the same for Fabicon as well. Um, <coughs> so that's one of the common files. So these are common to to uh, to all the sites. Uh, next one is um, what's the next one down? Uh, WordPress super cache. So I'll, I'll show you the super cache rules. And again, these have been abstracted from the standard HT access ones that um, super cache plugin puts in there for you. Um, and basically, it sets a variable to say um, this is the cache URI. So in other words, whatever the URL is that they're coming in with, we'll set a variable cache URI to be that URL. And then we'll check whether we should 
turn that off again because we're basically looking for, if it's a post, so they're submitting a form, then we don't want to serve them cache content because it needs to be the result of that form. Um, if uh, the query string, if we've got a query string on the end, then again, we don't, we don't want to serve cached content because the query string might mean that it should give you different stuff. Um, if it's some of these specific URLs with WP admin in, XML RPC, the cron, and all those, again, we don't want to serve cache stuff. And if you ever look in the .ht access that Supercache gives you, it has similar rules for Apache to do the same thing. Um, and then this is uh, an important one looks at the cookies. So if there's a comment author cookie or any of the WordPress logged in cookies, then again, we don't serve cache files to those users. Um, and then, once again, the try files can't be in here. It needs to be in the individual file, otherwise uh, things will go wrong. So it's commented out here, but this is a standard one uh, that I started with. So that's what that include does. So that handles, basically, if... Um, so, do people know the way WP Supercache works? It creates a file on your filing system that, is, that matches the URL that the user requested. So, you, you get a URL, it's slash my page, slash my sub page, slash my sub sub page. And that's virtual, WordPress works that out and gets it in the database and returns some HTML. What Supercache does is turn that into an actual HTML file and save it on your filing system speeding up the access because now it's not WordPress involved, it's just sending you that file. So what this does is saying, with that URL, does it exist on the filing system? If it does, then pass it to, then, then serve it from Nginx and don't pass it to the PHP stuff. So that's what that does. Um, and then the final one this is, uh, on here that's been included is the sitemap one, and that is just um, a fix for, uh, did I put that in? Oh, I didn't put that one in. Uh, but it's a couple, just a couple of rules that map um, the CSS files that sitemaps are looking for to WordPress um, because they're not PHP files, so normally Nginx would handle them, but we have to pass them on to WordPress so that the plugin can handle them. Um, so, um, and then as I say, this final bit says look for the Supercache file, um, and the, what this try files does is it's the much, much faster, I believe five times faster or some number like that, uh, way of doing if tests. So within .ht access, uh, um, with mod rewrite and within Nginx, you can actually say if it's this, then do that. Else if it's something else, then do something else. What this does is, is the equivalent. So this is actually saying try these in this order. Cache file, blah, 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 super cache, index.html. If it's not there, try the URI, so the actual URL if it's not there. Uh, try the URI with a slash on the end. If that's not there, then finally do index.php, pass it on to WordPress, and WordPress will hopefully handle it. Um, and this, uh, as I say, is uh, uh, apparently five times, at least five times faster than just doing the if tests, which you do occasionally see. Um, and so what this is doing is taking what originally started as the kind of standard Nginx stuff that you find uh, on the web on how to run WordPress under, Net, under Nginx, um, and modifying it so that we can run multiple uh, instances without having um, <coughs> the issues over security. So each user gets their own PHP threads and therefore anything that WordPress writes can only be written to stuff that, that they happen to own. Um, what else can I tell you about this stuff? Let me just look, see what other things I've got on here. Um, there's a couple of extra things, actually, yes, this is worth talking about. Um, Brute force protecting your WP login, um, and as it happens, XML RPC after that started happening last year. What this does is, let me just roll that up. Uh, oh no, you can't see it. Um, it's a special, I, and I had to get some help on the web for this. Uh, it's a special rule in Nginx that you can do. It's, it's a limit request zone. So it's, it's that what this is actually doing is setting up um, a bit of memory space in Nginx to store IP addresses. So binary remote address, which is the IP address, um, I'm calling it zone one so that I can refer to it as zone one. Um, I'm setting up to be 50 megabytes, so that's how much space, memory space it's got to store IP addresses. And then we set a rate, and here this is 30 requests a minute. So it's got this various syntax, you can do one a second, or you can do five a minute, or whatever you want to do. It allows you to rate limit uh, specific requests. So this is just setting up somewhere to store IP addresses so that it can check if they've gone over the rate limit. 
are then within the uh, standard configuration file, which is down here. Um, what I've got is for this particular file, I'm saying uh, limit request zone one, so that's the block of memory that we've that we've configured. Um, you can actually allow a burst rate, so maybe the first two or three are okay, but then you don't want any more if it keeps going. In this case, I'm saying no, just apply the rule straight away with no delay. Um, and then if it passes that limit, then it goes on and gets passed on to the PHP. So what this does is allow Nginx to stop too many multiple requests to wp-login.php for the same, from the same IP, which of course is scripts trying to brute force your machine. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. On, on I'm, my own personal sites have been around for so long. Unfortunately, I am a target, um, and I ha I've had um, in excess of um, <laughs> at its peak when the server starts slowing down. I think it was nearly a thousand requests a minute to wp-login.php on my server on my z1.com server. Um, and this has been brilliant. I put lots of other meshes in place as well. Uh, but this stops it on everything, um, and I used this recently on my client site where he's got over 200 subsites on a, on a WordPress multi-site. It's made a huge difference um, to just cutting down the amount of processing power that goes to WP login. And then of course XML RPC started being used uh, middle of last year for distributed denial of service attacks where they could use your legitimate P uh, WordPress site to attack some other remote target by using the uh, pingback um, technology using XML RPC. Uh, so this does the same thing, it limits them to, in my case, uh, thir was it 30 requests a second? I've just forgotten what I did. Um, 30, sorry, 30 requests a minute, so one every two seconds, which is legitimate if somebody's got the password wrong and they go, oh no, type it in again and hit enter, they could probably do that within two seconds, so legitimately they can, they can uh, or, or it'll take them, sorry, at least two seconds. Uh, so um, it is legitimate 30 requests a minute. Anything less than that can be, uh, sorry, anything uh, slower than that, it can get a bit tricky, um, especially something like, um, you know, five requests a minute. People can try the password a couple of times within that, that limit. Um, but it's nice because it stops it hitting WordPress. It doesn't even need to hit limit, limit login requests, although I use that as well. Um, so that's the main stuff on there. There's a couple of extra bits. You may spot at the top. Um, and this is where I'm doing, basically I've got lots of other domains that map to the same site. So I've got various uh, examples of examples.com, so the dub 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 one, uh, examples.co.uk, examplesingular.com that somebody offered to sell me for a silly amount of money and I refused. And then I checked about two months later to see, has he actually managed to sell it? And it was available, because obviously he hadn't, <laughs> so I bought it. <laughs> uh, and WP example without the dash, because lots of people don't like dashes, but I love them. Uh, and they all redirect, basically, to the, um, the same one. So it's the return 301 permanent redirect to that same <coughs> sort of examples.com. So that's the, the master one. And again, I'm doing it at this Nginx level, so it's much faster than doing it in PHP or, or anything like that. Um, but what I did discover when I first tried to do this is you actually have to put a root directory in there even if you're never going to use it and Nginx isn't going to use it. It doesn't like a server rule without a root directory somehow. Um, and I put the access logs in there, although it never actually gets to them because it does do the, the redirect. Um, so that's about it, apart from just one more thing. Um, and what's interesting, virtual min and I've got all the links for how to set it up and how to set up um, uh, Nginx with it. One of the things it says is you can't run multiple secure sites on Nginx the way they do it. Yeah, you can, apparently. I sussed it out. Um, again, searching around the web and trying some experiments. Um, and some of you may have seen, you may have spotted a couple of tweets, uh, probably only about three weeks ago, where one of my sites wasn't validating properly on mobiles. Um, because I haven't set my certificate all correctly, um, but I managed to fix it. Um, and so basically, the settings for that um, are, where are we, where are SSL, there we go, SSL example. Um, so this is another one, similar thing, and this is, I've got the same, similar uh, stuff. I've got an extra redirect rule here, which is if they come in um, with, on port 80, so this is only listening on port 80, which is a standard, insecure or non-secure web, web uh, port, 
then it redirects to the secure version. So I'm actually bouncing anyone who comes in on straight HTTP, bouncing them to HTTPS. So that's another rule in there. And then everything's exactly the same standard, apart from we have a couple of rules for SSL. So we turn on SSL for this particular thing. And, oh, sorry, further up there, it's listening on port 443, standard SSL port, uh, but you tell it that it's listening on that port, and that's the SSL port. Everything else is the same. And then we've got these rules for SSL. This is me finally figuring out how to put my certificate in so that it does validate properly. It was validating on my desktop, but it wasn't validating on phones. Um, and you actually need to concatenate three different certificates together. Um, but your SSL certificate supplier will give you that information. Um, install it somewhere. Again, I've installed it separate for each site. Um, the key, which is my generated server key, and then this is certificate uh, or the bundle of certificates for this particular site. Um, and it's just standard. The only thing, as I understand it, is that old versions of Internet Explorer 6 and below will complain that it's not secure because they're unable to, or they don't supply a special thing that's been around for more than a decade that, that allows you to have more than one uh, SSL <coughs> on a server. Did you have a question? Oh, yes, yeah, so you not have SSL v3 turned off now? Say again, sorry? SSL v3, should that be disabled? Um, is it not? Well, you've got it Oh, you're right. That sh yes, that should be. Um, this might be an old file. I'm hoping this is an old file that I've copied off my... Because I copied these off my hard disk, not off the server. So, um, yeah, I, will, I shall check on that. Um, I remember deleting that, so it's, I think this is an old one. But thank you for pointing that out. Um, yes, yeah, so SSL3 has turned out to be no good, and you need to disable it now. Um, so, yeah, so... IE6 will get a warning about coming to my site and say it's not secure, but I don't care. That's if you have, that's only if you're trying to use the same IP number on the Yeah, site. Which, is, which is exactly what I'm doing here, and this is the thing they tell you you can't really do, but actually you can. So yeah, so, so these are all the same IP number, and therefore you can't use the old school, which had to be one SSL certificate, one IP number. Um, they brought in, more than a decade ago, a way to get around it, but of course IE6 doesn't do that because it's more than a decade old. Um, some special timeouts and then, and I, I'm just, I've taken these uh, from the net where uh, people who know much more than me have recommended these particular settings, so I've done that. Um, and even this prefer server ciphers on, whoosh, don't know what it means, it's on there, it works. Um, but otherwise the rest of that, oh there's loads of this, that I don't know, I don't understand this. Um, I don't understand all this, all this malarkey, I don't even really know, I know, I know what they are, they're all different cipher thingies, and then it all gets vague, <laughs> it, it all gets vague at that point. Um, but yeah, so you can run SSL, and so, so I've now got multiple SSL uh, servers, uh, sites running on the same server as well, um, and yeah, hopefully that's uh, useful to you. As I say, I've shared that link, which gives you uh, links to all these example uh, files. I don't think there was any more, oh, one last one because somebody asked me about this when I gave my talk at this talk at uh, my local meetup. Um, what about if you still need to use, either you want to use Nginx in front of Apache, which some people do because they might be using a plugin that really wants to constantly modify .ht access, uh, and I've not yet come across a plugin that will properly handle Nginx configuration. Uh, W3T cache, W3 cache? Um, gives you a conf file that you need to include from the server level, but basically Nginx doesn't support the equivalent of .ht access, um, so it's a pain in the backside. Uh, but, uh, for example, I've got some subversion repositories on my server, and there's no Nginx, uh, no adding subversion adding for Nginx, um, so I wanted to still use Apache. So in this case, I moved Apache over to a different port, port 8080 in this case, I think. Um, and then just used um, Nginx as a proxy. So, oh, 8081. So basically, uh, what this does is it's Nginx is a standard front end. So any requests that come into this particular um, address, so in this case it's uh, example.version-control.com, um, which is a nice domain that I managed to buy myself, version-control.com. Um, and all it does is everything gets forwarded on to, in this case, local machine port 8081 um, and that happens to be Apache running so all the stuff comes through Nginx but it still actually goes off to Apache so it gives you that ability as well so 
Again, hopefully that might be useful under certain circumstances. Um, and in fact, in the early days of Nginx, it was used as a front-end proxy caching server for, for a lot of standard um, Apache sites because it's got some nice caching features as well. Um, and that's about it um, on that. I can go into a little bit more about the other things that I do on sites in terms of um, not having all my eggs in one basket, if that's of interest to people. Um, in fact, I'll tell you anyway. So I keep my, <laughs> I keep my registration separate from my hosting, which is separate from my <coughs> DNS. Because if you don't, and your hosting company have problems, it's all gone. And you can't get at it to fix it. Been there, done that, server offline for 14 days before they got their data center back up and running so that I could recover my files. Because, oh yeah, my backup was on the same server as well. Lesson learned many years ago. That was my first dedicated server. Ouch. Um, so, uh, and again, I've got a list of the companies that I use in the, um, well, where are we? Oops, no, back, I call back. Um, where are we? In this one, in this links. So, as it happens, I use, um, so just some links here, Nginx, Nginx site there. And again, you're welcome to download this file and, and grab all those links. Uh, virtual min, the control, and that URL is the how to add on Nginx to your virtual min server. Um, a lot of this stuff I've learned from RT Camp. They're the people who do the Nginx add-in plugin. Um, so they have a whole bunch of tutorials, but again, every single one assumes you're running one site on one Nginx server. Um, but yeah, they've got loads of stuff. And if you are running one site on one Nginx server, they've got a new thing uh, that they've just rewritten in Python called Easy Engine, which gives you a single command line to set up a whole WordPress, set up all the Nginx, set up all the cache caching, you tell it which plugin you're gonna do, it installs WordPress for you, installs the plugin, um, and does everything and sets it all up for you. It looks really, really nice little tool. Um, and I'm gonna start playing with it when I do want to set up one site on one server. Um, Vulture is what I've been playing about with for setting up one site on one server. Um, they're a bit like Ocean, what's the other one? Digital Ocean. So they're doing 100% um, SSD virtual uh, uh, VPSs for $5 a month is a starting point. Okay, I'll try one of those. Um, my DNS that I mentioned, I use a company called Point HQ. Absolutely brilliant, not the cheapest in the world. But they do have a free offering that covers quite a few uh, domains. Um, so all my D DNS hosting is separate. Um, uh, oh, Gandhi.net, I buy all my domains through Gandhi.net, so my domains get, ho get hosted there. They point to point, uh, point HQ for the DNS, and then Point HQ points to my actual server uh, for the hosting, and to various different places for e email and so on. I also do um, use uptime monitoring. I've got two going on everything at the moment, status cake, um, and Uptime Robot, both of which do free plans and will do uh, five minute status monitoring. I know Jetpack does it now if you're Jetpack users um, and it does send you emails, but I like these a little bit better and they do an awful lot more. Um, and then my dedicated servers, I use a company called Rapid Switch. I've been using them for about um, set, six, year, five years now um, and just discovered this weekend, I've spent lots and lots of money with them because I've had multiple dedicated servers uh, with them. 16 grand, I think I've spent with them. Ouch, on hosting, soon adds up. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're all useful um, companies, ones that I recommend. And, and certainly if you want to look at uh, Nginx and WordPress, these tutorials are brilliant. I've learned a lot of stuff from that and just had to tweak it to make multiple sites work. Um, <coughs> questions? How much time have we got left? All right. All right, go on. Call the questions if anyone's yeah. got anything desperate. No? No? All right. That'll do.